very good morning or good afternoon based out of where you are located. Good morning to you too. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Perfect, Annie. So as you can see, the topic for today's session is an overview of Kenya's Data Protection Act. And uh, this is an exclusive webinar in uh, relation with Saro Academy and Annie. And uh, I'll also introduce Annie, but I'll leave it to her to introduce herself because uh, I think that's the best way to make sure that everyone understands what Annie does there in Kenya as a data privacy professional. So yeah, so the speakers for today, uh, that is me on the right, Krishna. So if you've been a part of some of our other webinars, you might have seen my face up. It's a probably a common face in Saro webinars as well. We talk a lot about security, data privacy, data protection, all the different aspects that we uh, usually tend to cover uh, during all the other webinars organized by Saro. Uh, then, of course, we have Annie, who is the speaker or is the main speaker uh, or the spotlight for today. So Annie works as a managing partner at Muti Advocates. And Annie, I would just leave it to you if you can introduce yourself and tell our attendees what you do and uh, what also motivated you to become a data privacy professional as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna. So my name is Anne Mutier and welcome everybody to this session. It's very cold in Nairobi today. Uh, but we are happy and we hope you'll be engaged in the session. Uh, by profession or by training, I am a lawyer. I've been practicing law for, this is my 15th year in practice. Um, and I have practiced uh, in various uh, sectors. I have gone in, I have been in private practice. I have practiced as an in-house counsel in various companies and then come back into private practice. And so I can say that what really motivated me to come into privacy is really, it's like came full circle for me because I have seen how things work in-house, how organizations uh, deal with processes and uh, management of data from an internal perspective. And now this law um, provides an opportunity for lawyers to help in process improvement data uh, and data management because it deals a lot with uh, how organizations should organize themselves to have a coherent strategy around managing their personal data or personal data that they handle. So that's what I can say for now. And I do practice at my, at my firm, uh, Mutier Advocates. We specialize in technology, data protection and IP law. Thank you, and I think that's, that was a pretty good introduction. So, Anne, what is the favorite aspect of data privacy or what is that uh, one thing about data privacy that appeals to you a lot? Uh, at this moment, can I say there's a favorite part? I just, what I really think is amazing about it is it's so dynamic. It, it has so many aspects to it. There's just not one side to data protection. Uh, at one moment, you're dealing with a regulator. The next moment, you're dealing with an, the individual, the data subject. Uh, and you have to know the universe of the laws of the compliance uh, framework that applies to you so that you can uh, give the best advice to your clients. Of course, I think I concur with that because if you look at the different sensitive data that we deal with usually in the data privacy realm, and uh, the sensitive data is something that differs from different, based on the culture, based on the geographic location, right? So the dynamic aspect that you mentioned can be seen in the kind of data that we consider as sensitive, right? So, and that is something that intrigues me a lot because uh, I also get to learn different cultures. Uh, I also get to have an understanding around different uh, 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 perceptions of people and their perspectives on data uh, subject rise as well as personal data and what personal data means to them. Right? So that's an aspect I quite enjoy about data privacy. Yes. Okay. Right. So a little bit about Saro Academy and what we do as an organization. So people who have trained with us before or people who have been a part of our webinars might know that we are training partners for, of course, IPP, PCB and DSCI, which are data privacy organizations. Uh, IPP, of course, we shall out different certifications such as CIPPE, CIPT, CIPM. And we are also an academy that focuses on empowering data privacy professionals, which is why we also focus a lot on these practical courses as well. You can just head over to our website in case you are interested in learning about the practical nuances of it. 
Uh, then again, of course, and I think this is very important. Uh, we have a disclaimer, right? Whatever discussions we are having as a part of this particular uh, webinar is not something that can be termed as legal advice because this is just a discussion on what our opinions are and what our statements are around different data protection laws as well as the Kenya DPA. So just a disclaimer that Anne and me, whatever discussions we are having, it is not something that can be termed as legal advice. Right, so coming to the agenda of today's discussion, uh, there are six major areas that we would like to cover. First, starting with the purpose and scope of the act. Why was the act introduced? What, what issue is it trying to solve? What are some of the exemptions to the provisions that have been uh, described? The key aspects, the data subject rights, which is a very important topic and which is basically uh, one of the center or a core subject of all laws as well. And then what can you do as an organization or what can you do as a controller? And then, of course, the penalties for non-compliance, which is something we probably use to tell our clients why they should also consider being compliant, apart from the, of course, uh, legal aspect to it. Over to you, and uh, let's talk a bit about the features of the Act and why do you think the Act is important and what it is it trying to achieve? Yeah, so um, I think it's uh, maybe just the where to start. Um, so we didn't have a law on data protection in Kenya prior to 2019. Uh, what we had was the constitution and some piecemeal legislations that discuss data protection in, you know, specific to sectors like the financial sector, healthcare center, sector, and so on and so forth. Um, if you look at the GDPR regime, and if you look at the history of GDPR, you look, you find that a lot of the push for change in the law was driven by changes in technology. So that when the internet was first adopted was the first time we saw principles and frameworks around data protection. When it was liberalized, we saw the EU directive on data protection and then the GDPR uh, when the internet of things became a thing. So for Kenya, I think what I can say has been the push and the motivation for the law at this point in time, really also is the technology aspect. If you are familiar with the Kenyan environment, we are also very heavily digitized as a, as a, as a, as a nation. We are the premier um, nation on um, digital money or mobile money through our M-Pesa platform. So there, there's a lot of technology, a lot of data that is processed through technological systems and could have been a great motivating factor. And also a lot of interest from the big tech companies to domicile themselves here in Kenya. And one of the conditions for that would have been a data protection law. If you look at the scope of the act, the act um, has a very broad scope, just like the GDPR. So it applies to processing of personal data um, by automated or non-automated means by two types of um, I can say entities or individuals or people. Uh, one is where you are established in Kenya or you are resident in Kenya and you process data of people located in Kenya. And the second is where you are not resident uh, in Kenya, you do not have a physical establishment or presence in Kenya, but you still collect data or you process data of data subjects in Kenya. For example, Saro, I'm sure you don't have a local office here in Kenya, but if you've collected data of Kenyans, uh, maybe pursuant to this webinar, then you too would be expected to uh, comply with the law. And that's important because um, it's coming out in the registration process that you have to declare your domicile uh, as you are registering with the data commissioner, that is whether you're based in Kenya or outside of Kenya. Understood answer. Does the territorial scope also expand to the fact that if, uh, for example, Kenyan citizens are visiting a country such as India, then uh, would that law would also have kind of some kind of scope that extends to Indian companies that are processing data, but these Kenyan residents or Kenyan people are in India as of now? No, so that so it 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 applies to you if you're located in Kenya. In Kenya, yeah. right, of yeah. course. So that is pretty similar to the GDPR as well, right? Because GDPR is also structured similarly in this case. Uh, it yeah. won't apply to you if you're traveling to a country which has inadequate data privacy laws. But if it has the adequate data privacy law and if you have some kind of cooperation with the other nation, then of course uh, the law is something that would be spread across. Yeah. Right. I think uh, one more part that these data privacy laws also enable is the free transfer of information 
and the, it also enhances the economic activity between two nations so yeah. what is your opinion on that and um it 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 works that way and it works best uh if 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 you have it as i've said again um the technology is the driving factor so the reason why you need to have this law is because you know in technology you cannot really tell where the data is moving to and from you need to have a framework to be able to to support it um one thing that happened when in the early days in you in in the eu when they started to come up with these laws is each country came up with its own law within the EU and became yeah. very hard to enforce uh, because you had to understand the different laws. So the harmonization of the laws is also a big factor or something that really assists in uh, bringing out, um, in, in making it easy to implement across nations. So what we have now happening in Africa is each country is coming up with its own law. Yeah. And now we're going, to come up with, we're going to end up in that situation where we have to uh, do a lot of interpretation across the different jurisdictions. And in some cases we might be in a limbo because it's forbidden in one state and approved in another. So hopefully we will work towards harmonization and having you know uniform framework so that it's easy to transfer the data across borders. Of course, of course. I think that's very well said because uh, the GDPR also focused a lot on the harmonization and bringing different countries together so, uh, to free the economic activity as well, right? So, and in your opinion, which law in the African continent do you feel is the most, uh, you know, uh, is the most there and giving rights to the data subject? Which law is the best for all the citizens? <laughs> no, I don't think I can make a call right now. Still early days. I think... Um... We started having these laws maybe 2018 uh, coming forward. So each country, each year we've been having new people, new countries onboarding their, their laws. So I cannot say, I cannot make a judgment call at this point on which one is most robust or, um, or, 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 or that. And also, I don't think I have interacted with all of them to that extent. So I reserve my comments on that one. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. So uh, let's talk a bit about the exemptions from the provisions of the Act. Right. So, of course, uh, personal data is something that will be collected for certain national interests as well. So what is your opinion on this and how do you feel is the right approach that a government might take or should take to make sure that the subjects or the data subjects receive their rights? But in the end, all the other laws are also kind of balanced. Yeah. So um, maybe I'll just speak about the exemptions and how they look like now. Sure. I, I don't know whether I can talk much about the right approach. But okay. one of the interesting areas, I think they, they, they are all self-explanatory and displayed on the screen, but the ones I would like to zone in on are around national security and public interest. For us, uh, when you look at the regulations in support of the act, the national security aspect of it has been designated to you know, three institutions, the defense forces, um, the National Police and the National Intelligence Service. But there's also a provision that has been made um, for any entity that it feels that, you know, it's processing for national security reasons to apply uh, for exemption. So that, that is interesting and unique to see. And we would like to see how that will play out in, in the public sphere around, around that. And then in matters of public interest, uh, just to avoid, I guess, abusing uh, of this, of this uh, exemption, the regulations have attempted to define uh, limitations to what exactly is public interest. And there are two types of uh, situations which are considered to be pro processing in public interest. One is if you're processing for a permitted general situation. So, for example, if you are trying to locate a missing person or if you are um, trying to prevent a crime, those have been uh, considered to be permitted general situations, but you could also be doing it for what we call permitted health situations, so that uh, then the act is exempting if uh, you are processing, you are in a healthcare provider, you're processing data for a data subject who's unable to give consent uh, and, and uh, you know, is in need of medical 
care. So it's, what is good about it is the limits, because we have had uh, instances within this jurisdiction where, uh, you know, things tend to be done outside the limits of the law. And when it's so broadly interpreted, uh, especially uh, some of these uh, public agencies, it can be subject to abuse. So I think that that's a positive uh, positive outcome from, from those exemptions. Um, the exemption around journalism, literature or art is interesting because it only exempts to the extent that you are processing, uh, it only exempts the application of the principles of personal data protection. So that um, in itself is interesting. Does it mean that these other aspects of the act still apply? Is something we have not seen or we have not gotten a much clarity, but what we are uh, meant to understand from the Dust Commissioner is that there will be a specific code that is issued that uh, discusses just how the exemption on journalism, literature or art applies. Um, purely household or personal activity, Unlike the GDPR, we don't have a definition around that. And so it's it's pretty much we are walking blindly here or trying to rely on what we can see coming out of the GDPR in the definition. So we expect to see some litigation around uh, some of these activities where people are contesting what I'm doing is a purely household activity and doesn't uh, fall within the, the mandates of the law. Um, the one around the prescription by the data commissioner, we are expecting that to come out. We don't have anything at the moment that um, speaks to uh, exemptions by the data commission. Understood. I think uh, as the law grows and as the law becomes more mature, even the data commissioners would understand more and how it applies to a uniquely different country and how the unique uh, you know, structure of data can be used and can be changed and can be modified so that all rights are also upheld. Right? I think uh, once the framework becomes more mature and there, there are more guidelines from the data commissioner as well, it will definitely help our understanding on what we should do and how we can help organizations become compliant to the law. Yeah. Right, so I think uh, we're probably waiting on some kind of communication from the supervisory authority as well. Uh, because if I just compare it with India, right, uh, recently India has started a lot of different surveillance activities to uh, by the government, of course, in interest of national security. But then again, the laws uh, or the upcoming Indian Data Protection Bill, we don't really understand how it is, you know, kind of divided and what exactly national security means. Because it could be subjective to some uh, particular government entity and it could be a different topic for a different government entity. So I think yeah. that is also yeah. something we are probably waiting from the supervisory authority for some guidance on that. On what exactly do you mean by national security? Yeah, that is true because um, when we say that the National Intelligence Service is exempt uh, as a blanket exemption, then of course we open the door for the surveillance yeah and all that. So for sure, those are areas that will heavily, heavily come under scrutiny as we go on with the implementation of the act. Of course, then again, uh, I think uh, what we all and what I'm also concerned about personally is that if a data subject has a request that they make to the National Intelligence uh, Agency, as an example, would the National Intelligence in Agency uh, respond to that request or would they, uh, you know, kind of disregard it? They will disregard it. They are exempt. They will rely on the exemptions in the in the provision. And maybe I can say something about that. You know, we also we also are in a very um, fragile, what can I say, situation as a country where we sit. We do have a little bit of uh, instability around some of our neighbors. So, and we've had a lot of terrorism attacks. So, some of these things are, in as much as we say, um, you know, there will be infringement. They're also for our own. Uh, best interest and security. So for sure, it will be a very delicate balancing act trying to find where is the best place to position uh, the exemption. Of course, of course. So, and we also have a question uh, on the chat section. I'll just direct this question to you as well. So the question is that uh, usually data protection laws in many nations do not provide exemptions for journalism, research, etc. So in your opinion, is this exemption required or does it has a scope of misuse like corporations processing personal data in garb of research? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I also I think for us also we are a bit um, 
grappling with it and why it was introduced. Yes, it is. It could be uh, very open to misuse. Um, but what we've seen maybe from some clients, we've handled a, a few clients in this sector. And uh, one of the things we've seen as an advantage is especially where they want to, um, you know, the freedom of the media to bring out the news, in the, to bring it out in the best um, possible way and, you know, most representative of the situation on the ground. When they've had the exemption, they are able to, you know, interview the people liberally, have people um, come forth and open and share their data without the fear that they are going to be uh, sought after uh, because of misusing data. But what I will say is for journalism especially, the, 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 the restriction is not very clear. It's not very clear how the exemption applies because the act says it applies to um, the process, the principles of processing, so that it's only the principles that are exempt. So we are not very clear whether um, these other aspects of the law apply. And I guess this is why the law also has said that the data commissioner should publish a code to explain in detail how the exemption will work. Understood, of course. And I think there's a lot of gray area as it usually is in the uh, a new law that comes up in any country. But then again, I think we'll have to uh, increase our understanding on what the law exactly says and whatever questions or gray areas are there, we'll probably reach out to the data commissioner to fill in those gaps as well. Yeah. Right. So a certain set of key definitions are something that is also present in the GDPR. So maybe I could just direct it to you. And uh, what do you think are the different uh, key definitions that someone should consider when, you're look when they are looking at the Data Protection Act? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think the ones we've listed here are really the critical ones um, and for, for, for various reasons. The controller and processor definition is, is especially important for organizations that are, want to register in Kenya. It has an implication on your application for registration. So you must know which one you are. So a controller is uh, essentially a person. It could be an individual, it could be an entity, a public agency that has the power to determine the purpose and means of processing personal data. And so um, this is really broadly most, uh, you know, the organizations that go out there to seek business and, you know, onboard clients, but it also could be non-governmental organizations. So NGOs also fall within this. It could be public entities, except civil registration entities. Those are, um, they are controllers, but uh, those ones are not um falling under uh, a registration requirements in Kenya. Then we have the term data processor. And so this is the organization or individual that processes personal data on behalf of the data controller. Um, and they can do it either alone or jointly with other uh, processors. And the distinguishing factor, the key distinguishing factor between the two is it needs to be a contractual relationship so that the data controller contracts the data processor to do processing on its behalf. Uh, based on recent guidance that we saw coming from the data commissioner, the, um, what do I call it? The, the examples they've given around who a data processor is, is that it is a, it, this organizational person does not have a direct relationship with the data subject. So that's a test or a, a good way to test whether you're a controller or a processor. And so it, the implication is that um, if you're a controller, you have to register as such. If you're a processor, you have to register as such. And in some cases, if you're both, because some organizations play both, uh, you have to uh, register as such and you need to make separate applications so it's not a joint application for your organization. You have to register separately for both roles uh, that you play. The third definition around what personal data is, is also really important. Um, it is data that relates to an identified or an identifiable natural person. Um, uh, straight from the GDPR, I guess, uh, yeah. very similar to GDPR definition. Only difference is that within the Kenyan jurisdiction, we have not uh, defined whether it includes data of deceased persons. 
and uh, within GDPR, I think those are uh, excluded. So in Kenya, we, we we don't have any exclusion for deceased persons. So at this moment, we are then also treating them still as a natural uh a person so uh identifiable meaning that you can uh, you can uh, identify the individual by a combination of two or more factors and this brings in the concept of online identifiers you know cookies web tags ip addresses if they can together be put together to profile or you know um point to a given individual then those are considered to be personal data Sensitive personal data, again, is uh, we, our definition is heavily looking like uh, what we have in the GDPR, um, it, health data, uh, person's race, religion, ethnic origin, conscious, genetic data, biometric property, but we also have family uh, data, that is information relating to your spouse and your children, and um, sex and sexual orientation, uh, which we find to be a, a little bit peculiar because um, issues of sexual orientation are uh, outlawed in our laws. So it's a little bit contradictory to some of our existing laws. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that pans out as implementation of the act goes. And so in the registration process, again, you'll be required to define the types of personal data that you process as an organization uh, in detail. So is it bio data, contact data, um, location data and the likes, and also the types of personal data have been categorized uh, and you need to declare the types you, you, you process and also give the purposes of processing these two types of data. Of course, I think uh, most of the definitions are somewhat taken out from the GDPR, of course. But then again, when we talk about sensitive personal data, that would be unique to the country. Right? Because uh, maybe some of the sensitive data types have been identified, but some may have not been identified as of now, which would probably also, like you rightly mentioned, could also contradict with the existing laws. Right? Because uh, uh, those are some aspects I think we'll probably understand in the future as well. And then, uh, Anne, we had a question in the chat section as well, uh, which I wanted to direct to you, uh, if you can also view it. Can data controller be like an organization and the data process the ICT director? Yes, so, so, so that's a good question. No, so employees within an organization are represent who the organization is in full. So if you are working in a controller organization, uh, and it, it, even if you're different departments, HR, IT, and so on, you're all controllers. You're all working for the controller. So the processor relationship is a contractual relationship where you actually contract a third party company or entity to do some processing on your behalf. So for example, if you are in Kenya, you are a HR um, department in, a, in an organization. So, so to speak, you're the controller. As an employer, you're the controller. And you decide to subcontract some aspects of your HR processing, like for example, background search, you know, or if you're trying to do a background search, you subcontract that to a third party. In that case, then that is a processor relationship. The test being again, is that third party having any direct relationship with the data subject? Did the data subject give the data to the uh, to the controller. If they give the data to the controller, then the processor can easily say, I have no direct relationship with the uh, controller. Understood, understood. I hope that answers your question. And if you have a follow-up question to that, please feel free to put it in the chat section. So, and we just have another question from Julius, which is that, is the data controller and the data processor status dependent on the structure of the organization or on the different types of transactions the organization engages in? Yeah, so thank you, Julius. It, it depends on, uh, on what, on whether, we go back to the definition, on whether you determine the purpose and means of processing personal data. So for example, if you are, uh, uh, for those in Kenya, I will use Safaricom. If you are Safaricom, you decide um, to give M-Pesa as a service. You're the one who decides what kind of data you will pick from the members of the public 
to give them that kind of a service. So because of that, if that decision you make, then you are the controller. And then um, you again as Safaricom, you're the one who decides what systems am I going to use internally to process this data? I'll use Oracle, IBM, whatever the system, those are your processors. So really it depends, again, you go back to the definition, that's what guides you in knowing whether you're a controller or a processor. Right, so we have a follow-up question on that and a couple of questions. So, uh, okay, so Esther has this question. She wants to know if, say she is the legal officer of the organization, would she be the processor or does she need a different contract from the employer? No, so uh, Esther, you would not be the processor because um, you do not, uh, you, you, you are part of that organization. You're, de you're, you're defined collectively as an organization. So employees are not processors. Employees within an organization are not processors. A processor is an actual entity or third party who you give, your organization gives data to process on its behalf. Understood. So, and I think uh, there's a bit confusion around our attendees around uh, what a data controller is and what a data processor is, right? Yeah. So uh, putting it in simple terms, data controller is someone who decides why the data is collected and the purpose for its collection. The data processor is someone who responds or is directly reporting to the controller on how they would process this data. And the data controller would tell the data processor that this is how you should process the data. And they are supposed to follow those uh, guidelines and those uh, uh, suggestions by the data controller, because in the end, the onus is on the data controller. Whenever there is a data breach, either through the data controller or the data processor, the data controller would be liable to pay the fine, even if they take that fine amount from the data processor as well. But in the end, the data controller is someone who's affected. So I hope that answers a few questions that people have here. Uh, so Sylvia has another question and they would want to know, would consultants who do not have a direct relationship with the data subject, but process data provided by the controller be required to register? Yes, yes. So data processors must register. So registration is for both. It's for both data controllers and data processors. So even if you don't have the direct relationship, but you have been uh, contracted by a controller to do some part of processing for them, you will be required to register. Right. So a couple of other questions that I would quickly take on uh, because Jean has this question and they want to know if retailers be, can retailers be both data processors and controllers in relation to customer details such as location for deliveries? Yeah. So an organization can play both. Yeah. So as a retailer, for example, if you employ people within your organization, you're a data controller because for you to make the employment decision, you decide what data to collect from people and how you're going to process it. And then to give the service maybe to, to, to maybe if you have been, um, say you have been uh, commissioned to give maybe deliveries or, or what can I call that? Yeah, delivery service. Then in that aspect, the company that contracts you to give that service uh, could fall into that. So for sure, uh, I agree with the next comment I can see there around, around it being confusing. It is, it is a test. It is something you have to do weighing the different processing activities that you do within your organization, okay? So you have to look at it and say, what decisions? Am I making decisions on the data? Am I the one receiving the data? And am I the one making the decisions on how to use the data? Then that makes you the controller, yeah? Yes, of As course. So we'll move on to the next few slides. Don't worry, we'll uh, definitely answer the questions that are on the chat section. And I hope the next slides we have probably gives a bit of more clarity to uh, everyone on what we're exactly talking about. And it hopefully answers some of your questions as well. Right. So and let's talk a bit about the data subject rights that are provided to people of Kenya. Right. So let's talk a bit about that. And what are your opinions on that? And what are the different rights that are provided to people? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's very wide. Uh, the rights are, are quite a number. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know, uh, let me just try to highlight I think them. Let's focus on the top five rights or the uh, most important rights amongst all these, because of course, uh, some of these rights are relatable or maybe, uh, you know, kind of give out the same sense. But what are the top five critical rights that you see that are provided to people? Yeah, so uh, I guess the first one would be the right to information. 
that one is really, really, uh, what do I say? It, 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 it comes out very strongly in the law, in the act and the supporting regulations. Do not collect data without informing the data subject. And the, what you need to inform them about is outlined in the law. It's actually in very great detail. So privacy notices must be supplied at the time of collection of data. Um, if you collect indirectly, you have to supply the information within 14 days of collection of uh, the information. So that, that's a big area. Uh, the other one that we see big is actually this right to lodge the complaint to the data commissioner. We have seen a couple of people already uh, making complaints to the data commissioner about misuse of their data, especially around direct marketing and around digital lenders. The digital lenders, uh, have been unscrupulous in some of the practices they've been employing. And so we've been seeing uh, that right being exercised. We have the right to access. Unfortunately, in our law, uh, we don't have so much guidance around how the right to access is going to apply. Um, and what is also uh, a bit um, unsettling is that uh, we've been given seven days to respond with a request for access. I think in GDPR, it gives, is it 60 days in some yeah. jurisdictions? I see. So we have a very short window to respond to the right to access, which could be one of the most complicated uh, rights. Again, it doesn't have limitations. I think in GDPR, there are some limitations or some of the jurisdictions within the EU have defined limitations around what exactly is that right? How far can you go in asking? Right. So if there is a disproportionate effort that needs to be put in to get out that data, then the data controller may be allowed to reject that request as well. Yes, so we don't have those exemptions in yeah. our law. So that will be interesting to see how it plays out. The right to erasure is also an interesting one. Um, and just like the GDPR, it's not, um, it's not absolute. It has... Yeah exemptions. Uh, there are situations in which you can refuse the right to erasure. Um, for example, if you need to use the information for a court case or to defend a claim, uh, those are situations in which the right to erasure uh, would not apply. And then um, the right to objection uh, kind of moves together with the right to make that complaint. It's, it's working together, but the right to objection is you actually approaching the data controller or processor and saying, uh, you know, um, I don't want you to keep using my data. I, I object to the use of my data or further processing of my data. Uh, what I can say in, in some of all these rights is that they are not absolute, um, except the right to objection for purposes of um, the right to objection for purposes of direct market profiling. Yeah? yeah. So if somebody comes to you with a request, a direct marketing objection request, you have to process that. You cannot respond with a different answer. So, um, and the other thing I want to mention here is at least the law has given us um, the right to verify the person who submits uh, the request. So we, we can go through a verification process. It's not clear whether the verification process falls within the window or timelines of process or whether it buys you additional time to actually, you know, then enforce the responses. So we, we are just seeing it as that, that uh, we are allowed to, to go through a process of verification, confirming the person who has lodged the request before we make the request. And so what we are, uh, advising clients to do here is really to come up with a handbook that guides your DPO or your internal resource around how to respond to these requests and uh, making sure you have a good process mechanism internally to receive the request and respond with it to it within the timelines that have been provided, even as we move on. Yeah. Of course, of course. I think uh, most of these rights are also directly related to GDPR as well. But then again, uh, there are some exemptions there that have been thought of, which are not as uh, as of now a part of the DPA from Kenya, right? So mm -hmm. those aspects would definitely be covered as well. Then uh, let's go back to the controller and processor and the duties of uh, the different type of uh, these terms that have been defined by the Kenya's DPA, right? So Anne, over to you. Let's speak a bit about the duties of a data controller and a processor. 
Yes, yeah, so thank you. So unlike the GDPR, which actually gives very good delineation between a controller and a processor, the Kenyan law has kind of lumped up um, many of the obligations are lumped up to both controller and processor so that uh, it, it can be confusing. I, I think I saw somebody commenting about uh, there could be a lot of responsibility on the controller, but it doesn't come out on the face of it when you look at the law it, because the duties are lumped together. So if you read the act right now, it says controllers, processors, they need to adhere to the data protection principles. They need to observe the rules on data collection or how to collect data, whether directly or indirectly. They need to assign the lawful basis for processing data. They need to observe the rules for processing you know, when it comes to children's data, health data, marketing data, and sensitive personal data. They each need to conduct uh, data protection impact assessments. Um, they need to implement data protection by design and by default to adhere to the international data transfer rules, to appoint a DPO, you know, where, where, where necessary and to register with the data commissioner. So if you look at it, then it looks like there is no separation between what so, exactly- And I had a question here. Is this mandatory to appoint a DPO in all cases for any entity? No. No, no, it's not. It's not the, the, the wording of the act is that you may- appoint a, a DPO, but then it says if you're a private or public body. And that kind of is like every institution is a public or private body. But the wording of the act is that you may appoint. So suggesting that it's not mandatory for you to appoint a DPO. Right. And how does this registration work? I mean, what kind of registration? Is there like a, a specific format or spe specific documentation form that you have to apply for and sign with the data commissioner? So the registration process is actually online through the data commissioner's website. There is a portal they have provided. It went live last week on Thursday. So we've just started the registration process. Uh, okay. There is no given deadline for registration. So people are expected to you know, register as soon as possible. And uh, how it kind of works is that, um, so what I was saying is that you, you need to kind of uh, declare your processing activities, the types of data you collect, how you collect the data. Uh, sorry, no, the types of data you collect, that's whether personal or uh, sensitive personal data and the purposes for which you collect the data. You have to give a little bit of information about yourself. So your the name of your entity, where you're operating from. And so that means, remember the scope. So if you're operating outside of Kenya, you have to declare the country where you're operating from. You have to declare um, whether you are using uh, cloud-based systems so that there is an international transfer of data happening. You have to declare the safeguards you have in place if you're doing an international transfer of data. You have to declare um, your turnover, financial turnover for prior year because a registration is pegged on your turnover and the number of employees that you have as at the point of registration. So those are the things that you need to kind of declare. You need to declare your DPO if you have one, that's an optional field for, for declaration. And so once you have put in the information on the portal, the expectation is that the data commissioner will take time to review your application and then, um, once they review, they can come back to you for further information, or they can then approve and issue you with a certificate of registration. Um, the main thing here is that uh, they have made it an offense for you to provide inaccurate or false misleading information during registration. So that means then by the time you get to registration, you have to have a good handle on the type of information that you're processing and actually give good details around the categories of data subjects you're handling and the types of data you, you process for those data subjects. Understood, understood. So, and what are the repercussions of not registering with the data commissioner? So failing to register is an offense. Uh, it attracts some general penalty of 3 million. Okay. Uh, and um, I think it also attracts imprisonment an imprisonment term. I don't know whether it was two years. Uh, I, I forget it off, off the top of my head, but it is um, it is an offense to fail to register. Again, also maybe something I can mention about registration is that um, the point has escaped me. That's fine, <laughs> that's fine. 
the point has escaped me, but I'll come back to it. And <laughs> That's fine, Anne. So we'll just yeah. go back a bit to the questions we had. Uh, so I think this is also a question that I had. So can one personally apply as a DPO and are there any qualifications that the data commissioner has determined that a DPO needs to be qualified, has needs to have these many years of experience or probably experience in the privacy domain as a lawyer? Are there any uh, guidelines on that? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure about the question around personally applying. So does it mean that, uh, you know, if, you know, the person is asking whether in their personal capacity or they can do it on behalf of their organization? So if it is on behalf of your organization, yes, you can apply on behalf of your organization. Uh, you can do the registration process on their behalf. The next thing is um, around, what was the next part of the question? Yeah, so what qualifications does one need to be certified as a DPO? Um, so we don't, uh, we, we are not certifying yet um, as an, as a country, we don't yet have a certification body. We are relying on the international certifications out there, IAPP and the likes. But what the law says is that ideally it should be someone who has, you know, technical knowledge on matters to do with data protection generally. So professional qualifications and uh, technical knowledge on data protection. So that ideally, and then also the person should have, not have a conflict of interest in case you're choosing somebody who's already existing in your organization, you know, like you're giving them a double hatting role, uh, in whatever role they sit in should not present a conflict of interest. So for example, if there are key processing uh, uh, department, for example, like uh, they are in um, HR, where you're the ones who are determining what you need from employees, ideally that would not be the most ideal person to serve as the DPO. Right, right. So, and uh, in the GDPR, there's a mandate that you need an EU representative who can respond to certain complaints by data subject or who can be a middle person for the data supervisory authority and the data subject. So is there a you know, similar law in the Kenya DPA? Do we need to have a Kenyan uh, representative? No, no, it doesn't say that it needs to be a Kenyan, just says that you can appoint a DPO. And I think maybe the rationale, I, I, even as they were coming up with the law, they really debated around this point on the DPO. It's also the affordability and looking at our own unique circumstances as a country. Uh, so they didn't make it as stringent as it is. So we don't even have the definitions around it should report the highest level of management and the likes. It's, it's a little bit open and a little bit more lax than we have it in the GDPR. Right, right, of course. So uh, coming back to the deck here, I think one difference that we see uh, with notifying the data control of a breach from a data processor's perspective is that they need to do it within 48 hours. Yeah, yeah, right. so there's so, that. Yeah, this is the only area where we see a difference between the controller and the processor in the act. The one area is that, you know, uh, if, if a breach happens, it's the controller's responsibility to report to the authorities and to notify data subjects. And the timeline is 72 hours, just as with the GDPR. But then now for the processor, that the duty is to report to the controller within 48 hours. And then the other uh, distinction we see is this distinction around contract, that the controller must appoint the processor by, by virtue of a contract or through a contract, a data processing agreement. The yep. contents yep. of the contract are actually outlined in the law, what exactly should be in that data processing agreement. And the fact that the data processor must abide by the instructions of the data controller when processing the data. What that looks like is, that, or rather what the implication of that is, is that if you deviate from the instructions of the controller, then the, you are going to be assumed to be a controller and you will take up the responsibilities of a controller. So that is how the, the act has been worded. So the two areas are where really there's been a little bit of a distinction, but the rest of the law is just lumping up the conditions on both controllers and processors. Right, I think uh, it, uh, this, particular section where if the data processor does not follow the specified guidelines, if they make a, even a bit of a pivot from the original guidelines that were there, they are assumed as data controller. And then the data controller's uh, onus also decreases in nature because then of course it goes back onto the data processor again. Yes, yes. exactly, exactly. And, and, and the purpose of that contract is you know, to build in those indemnities for the controller to be able to, you know, to go after the processor 
in case they are fined and have to suffer those breaches, um, those fines uh, or damages. Of course. Okay. So, uh, and we have kind of divided this, this into three key aspects of the act. First is accountability. Second is individual, of course, uh, control. And then there is registration. Right. So what is your opinion and how do you feel these key aspects can actually help mature the data protection act that is coming up? Yeah. So um, my opinion is that, you know, the biggest thing now is for organizations to actually put in place to com uh, measures to comply. You know, uh, the act does not tell you you need to have these policies except them, you know, retention policy and the. Um, um, maybe the retention policy and the privacy notices or the right to information doesn't prescribe in detail what, what you're supposed to do. It is for you as an organization to determine based on the nature of your work and the, you know, the advances in technology, they have just given those guidelines. What are the best, what's the best way for me to comply with this law? And so it pushes accountability uh, to the organization, makes them responsible for making sure that they have in place these things uh, to comply with uh, the law. Another unique uh, aspect is the data protection impact assessment, uh, which then are now forcing organizations to um, be proactive in managing the risks relating to data whenever they're introducing new processing activities, new processing activities or things that consider to be high risk to the yeah. freedoms of individuals. So accountability is key. It's, it is, it is a, it's your honors as an organization to make sure these things are in place. When the audit happens, because in our law, the, it, it allows for the data commissioner to audit your processes, you will be tasked to prove that you have put in place adequate measures for protection of uh, data. Secondly, the biggest, the next big thing in this is the individual control, the fact that data subjects have rights to their data and the fact that you need to acknowledge them and respect them. But also uh, something unique that has been stated in the law, individual control, uh, there is an expectation that you should give data subjects autonomy or the highest degree of control over the data they handle. Yeah, so it's the data you handle. So for example, it could be a challenge for those organizations who are very manual, where you pick data very manually. And once the information is picked, somebody has no overview, can never tell what you have, can never rectify. So it is a push also for organizations to automate as much as possible and uh, give individuals control the right to be able to access the information through an app or a portal to change what is needed uh, you know, to the highest degree possible and so on and so forth. And then finally, the other uh, aspect that is interesting is around that registration, which we have spoken right. about. The fact that now you have to declare your status to the, to the regulator. And once you do that, it's expected that they'll publish a register on the website. So we will have a comprehensive register of all data controllers and processors, and they can then pick at any time which organization to audit. So it, it will be an interesting space to see. Maybe I, I just remember the point I was going to make about registration, that for some types of organizations, you must register whether or not you meet the financial or employee thresholds. So for example, if you're a healthcare provider, education institution, a gambling provider, those kind of companies must register, even if you started the company yesterday, uh, you, you have to get this registered. Right. So I think it also depends a lot on the sensitivity of the data that they collect, apart from the thresholds that the government has defined. Uh, a, a focus is basically on making sure that the rights are given to people. Yep. Right. So that sensitive data set that people or organizations would collect, it definitely falls under the purview of registration again. And we have a question here. Uh, I think you are the best person to answer this as well. Uh, could the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection upon ratification by 15 states act as a unifying law on Africa data protection laws just as the, just as the GDPR for EU? Could be, could be. I think if if the, all the states came together and agreed, it could be. Um, but what would happen is just what has happened in the EU. You then have the, the overall framework, but the member states still go on to create their own, uh, localize the law. So it would not completely do away with our law, but it would then just create that harmonization around how uh, African states are sharing 
uh, the data. Right. So I think this probably also brings us to the end of our slides as well. That's the last one we'll talk about is the penalties for non-compliance. So this is my favorite topic whenever I tell my clients or organizations in India how GDPR is also affecting them. Uh, but they're like, we do not uh, you know, cater to European citizens. They do not quite understand the nuances of the law, which is why this is the first slide we usually tell people why this is important. Apart from the penalties, of course, there's reputation laws. There are certain other aspects that you can consider. But let's talk a bit about the penalties, Anna, and what is your opinion on the different penalties for non-compliance? Yeah, so, uh, okay, for one, it's not as punitive as the GDPR, <laughs> um, which is a little bit of a reprieve there, uh, but it still is punitive uh, considering our own um, circumstances as a country. So um, one is that you can um, be fined and an administrative penalty can be imposed of up to 5 million or not more than 1% of your annual turnover, whichever is lower. So the ceiling is uh, 5 million shillings, around $50,000 um, for an infringement. But then we saw that in the regulations, they introduced a daily fine uh, of 10,000. So it's not clear. We think it is that it is 10,000 up to 5 million, but it's not very clear in the, in the law. Um, then there is the general penalty, 3 million. Um, so if anything, if an infringement is not covered in the act and you're trying to look for how much to penalize, that is where the general penalty would fall. And it would be 3 million um, or imprisonment of uh, up to an imprisonment term not exceeding 10 years. But also parallel to this, there is a separate process that can happen, which is that a data subject can go to court directly, you know, bypass or the data commissioner, bypass the complaints process and go to court directly and uh, seek reprieve from the courts. Uh, we also have regulatory sanctions. So, you know, the data commissioner can even, you know, issue an order suspending uh, your, 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 your processing operations until you have your house in order. So regulator, reg, regulatory sanctions are something that are coming out of it. The lawsuits, before, G, before we had the act, we did have a few data protection type of lawsuits that had come up and, um, you know, mostly around marketing and use of people's images uh, without consent. And what we would see, uh, you know, um, damages anywhere between one to five million shillings. So again, this is really in the purview of the court. They've put no limits on the damages. So uh, it can be a great exposure if you face a lawsuit uh, for misuse of data. Right, of course. I'm very curious to see what kind of fines the supervisory authority or the data commissioner puts in on Kenyan entities as well. Right, That is something that will probably happen in the future. Similarly, how it is happening in the European Union or China, as a matter of fact, because I just read that uh, they laid out a billion dollar fine on a cab hailing service, which was surprising to me. So these fines are coming up, right? Penalties are there for the non-compliance. And, uh, and this also brings us to the end of our session or the slides or topics or discussion we had today. So we'll just leave the last few minutes for a simple Q&A session. I believe there are a lot of uh, things people would want to ask and they are also keen on understanding your perspective on it. So uh, we'll just leave the last section, people. If you have any other questions that we have not covered, let me just look at the chat section again. So uh, Boniface, I think we have answered the question. Uh, if you need a template, we have put in a link there. You can uh, look at those templates. It's pretty good for a DPI that you would want to con uh, conduct. Yeah, I think uh, Damaris has a question. And the question is that in case of an internal data breach of a data subject, and the data subject raises an alarm with the office of the data commissioner before the entity, what is the action that can be taken against the organization? And hence the breach can be controlled within the organization. Yeah. So um, I, there is, <laughs> if, if the commissioner know, gets to know it before you, well, it's too bad. <laughs> it is, it's just too bad. You, you need to make sure that um, you are really adequately prepared for a breach. You have a good incident response plan and you're continuously training your staff on how to identify and escalate breaches to you so that you don't face those kind of situations. You, for sure, you can be reported to the data commissioner, even by your own employees. If you have rogue employees who you know, are disgruntled or something, they could directly go and nothing prevents them from doing that. Of course, of course. I think uh, those 
uh, avenues are always there, right? Insider threat is something we talk about a lot in the cybersecurity realm as well. So uh, I'll just talk upon one last question that we have, which is by Gene. So what if the processor is not a Kenyan entity and the data controller transfers data outside Kenya? How should the processor go about registration in this case? Yeah, so yeah, if the processor is based outside of Kenya, the, the, the registration process is the same. You just provide the same information. You'll give details around what, what kind of processing activities you're doing it for. Um, I haven't tested a registration as a processor, so I'm not very sure about the fields that they are asking processors to fill, but it is this, the expectation is that you still go through registration in the same way. Right, right. So, uh, Anne, I think we have covered all the questions that we had in the chat section, and we are right on time as well. So uh, I would just like to conclude this session, and I would like to thank you immensely for making your time for the session as well. I believe there are a lot of insights that people took out from the session. They have a better understanding of the law as well of the Data Protection Act. And I am pretty sure there will be follow up questions based on the webinar we had. We might have, uh, you know, uh, put in, uh, gave you a food for thought, maybe that is something that you would think about when you go back. So if, if you have any questions like that, we have put in the LinkedIn's of Anne as well as myself. So you can reach out to any of us and we would be happy to have a conversation around that as well. Of course, uh, we might not be able to respond immediately, but then again, we would definitely get back to you uh, based on the different questions you have, right? So thank you again, and thank you so much for your time and thank you for coming to this webinar. Okay. Perfect. Thank you everyone for making it to the webinar. Have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.